Okay, let's get started. Um, again, give it up for DJ Drop Tables. Thank you. Today's gonna be awesome. You know why? Okay. We're gonna talk about databases. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, quickly before we get started on today's material, again, just a reminder for what's uh, due or upcoming for you guys in the course. Homework three is due two days from now on Wednesday at midnight. Um, we'll have the final exam, or sorry, midterm exam uh, in class next week on the 16th. Um, and that'll just begin during a regular time. And then I'll do a quick uh, midterm review on the end of next lecture on, on Wednesday. And then we'll post uh, like a, a, a study guide on the website with all the information you need to know about preparing for the midterm uh, later in the week. And then project two, it will be due after the midterm on Sunday, October 20th. And then immediately after uh, project three will go out. So any questions about any of these expectations for you as a student? Yes? Uh, for the midterm, will you provide us some mock exams or past exams? His question is, will we provide a, uh, a previous exam? Yes, we will provide a, with, with solutions as well. Yes. When? Probably by this weekend. Yes? So I'll cover this on Wednesday. Yeah, you'll have one handwritten sheet of notes. No copies of the slides, no uh, you know, sh shrunk down version of the textbook. It has, it has to be handwritten. Okay? Again, so we'll cover this in more detail. It'll be up, into, up and including Wednesday's class. So everything on, from this class and Wednesday's class will be covered in the midterm next week. So just not next Monday. Just not next Monday, yes. Okay. So we've been talking about query execution. Uh, but we've been mostly focusing on, so far, how do we actually implement the operators in our query plan? How do we do sorting? How do we do hash joins? And so forth. So now, today, we're going to start putting this all together. And how do we e execute an end-to-end -end query and produce a final result to, to, to the application? So again, these are all the operators in our query plan. And we know how for a join, there's sort merge, hash join, nested loop join. If we had to do a sorting, we know the different ways to do sorts and aggregations. So now we're trying to put this all together and say, all right, how do we, uh, if we're given a query plan, how do we actually go ahead and execute it? <coughs> so to th there's three things we're going to discuss today. So the first is that we're going to talk about how do we actually process the query plan, right? And how do we organize the execution flow or the flow of data between these operators in such a way that you could produce, uh, produce the correct result. And we'll see how to do it in different ways for different environments or different uh, storage models for the things below us. Then we'll talk about the access methods, and we've already covered this uh, uh, in bits and pieces throughout the entire semester, how to do an index scan, how to do a sequential scan. So now we're just trying to understand this in a, in a bit more detail. And then we'll finish off talking about how to, do, uh, how to evaluate the predicates and expressions in our query plan. If we have a where clause, how do we, how do we uh, apply that where clause to a tuple, whether we're doing a sequential scan or an index scan? And again, you can see the, the, the high level uh, idea of what we've done so far is that we have a bunch of bits and pieces now of how to do sorting, how to do joins, how to do index probes. And now we're starting to put it all together to actually be able to execute a query. Okay? Alright, so the first thing we've got to discuss is the processing model. So a database systems processing model specifies how it's going to execute a query plan. Right? So in, in essence, it, it's specifying whether uh, you're going from top to the bottom, bottom to the top, and then between each operator, what are you actually passing from, from one to the next? And so there will be three different main, three main approaches we can do. Um, and they're all going to have different trade-offs and have different performance implications for different workloads and different operating environments. So we'll go through each of these one by one and, and show examples. So the most common one is, is going to be the iterator model. This is what pretty much every single database system you, you know about. This is, this is, for the most part, this is how they execute queries. Materialization model is, is a specialized version of this uh, that is primarily only used for in-memory systems. And then the vectorized model is, is again, it's, it's based on the iterator model, but you're sending batches of things or vector, vectors of things. Uh, and this will be more useful in uh, analytical workloads. OK? All right, so as I already said, the iterator model is the most common one. Uh, I think the textbook refers to this as the iterator model. You'll sometimes see this referred to as the volcano model or the pipeline model. 
So the volcano, the reason why it's called the volcano model is because there was an influential system in the late 1980s, early 1990s in, in academia called volcano that described at, at a high level exactly this, this approach. And people were doing this before, but this guy sort of laid out the, the, you know, the exact way to do this and in parallel, which is what we'll talk about on Wednesday. And the volcano system was invented by the same guy, Gertz Graffy, who wrote that B plus tree book that we talked about before. Uh, and it's also the same guy that implemented the volcano query optimization model, which we'll talk about next week. So this, that dude is pretty prolific. So the way this basically works is that for every single operator we have in our, in our database system, so if we want to support joins, we have a join operator. You know, for a sorting, we have a sorting operator. So for all of these, they're going to, they're going to implement a next function. And what happens is that the, a parent node will call next on their child node, and that child node will, will then produce as the return result for that next function the next tuple that the parent needs to process. So you can sort of see how this is going to cascade down. So I'll call next on the root, it calls next on its child, and it calls it, it's next on its child, and we'll keep going down until we hit the leaf nodes in our query plan, and then we start emitting tuples up the query plan and start processing them one by one. So the reason why that they're going to be called the pipe, also this is called the pipeline model, is that this is going to allow us to, for a single tuple to try to ride it up as far as possible up in the query plan and keep processing it in one operator after the other before we go back and get the next one. And this is important in a disk-based system because if it's every single, we can only have one page in memory, for example, then every single page, every single tuple, we go fetch that page. We want to do as much work as we can with that tuple while it's in memory before we go back and get the next tuple or get the next page. And so that, that, that series of work or tasks you can do in the query plan for a given, one given tuple is going to be called a pipeline. So let's look at an overview of how this works. So again, see, this is that same join we've been looking at before on RNS, on RID equals SID, and then we just have a simple predicate where S value is greater than 100. So normally I don't like to show code in, in lectures, SQL doesn't count because it's, it's beautiful, but like, I, I, but for this, we have no choice, right? So this is some pseudocode to showing you the different next functions for these operators, right? And essentially, they're just for loops that are iterating over the output of their child operator, right? So if you start at the very beginning, so say we start at the very root, we call next on the root node, right? This is, this is, the, uh, this is just a projection. And so it has a for loop where it's going to say, for every single tuple in my child that I get back from next, do the projection. So at the very beginning, when we call next, we enter this for loop. And think of it like it's like an iterator, where I can keep calling next. And if I go down and traverse and produce an output, if I'm called next again in my operator, I know how to pick up where I left off before. So at the very beginning, we call next on the root. It has no tuples. So the very first thing it has to do is now call next on its, its child which is the join operator. And the join operator is composed of two parts, so two phases, as we talked about before. To, to say we're doing a hash join, we have the build phase, we're going to build the hash table, and then we have the probe phase, we're going to probe the hash table. So again, the very beginning, I'm calling next in my, my hash join operator, I'm calling next on the left child, because that's when I, I want to populate the, 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 the hash table. So then this now invokes the function next on its child operator. So now you get in the leaf nodes. Now this is, again, this is our access methods. This is how we're accessing, retrieving tuples from either the index or the table. So this just has its own little for loop that's going to iterate over the relation R, and then it's going to emit a tuple up. So for every emit function, we're passing up a single tuple as the return result for the invocation of next. And so we'll keep doing this. The, 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 the parent operator, the join operator, will keep calling next on his child over and over again. This thing keeps emitting tuples up. Inside the for loop, we're building our hash table. Then at some point, we reach the end, we process all the tuples, and then we just pass up a null pointer, and then now the parent knows that I've gotten everything I'm going to get out of my child. I never need to go back to it again. All right, so again, it's called the iterator model because these are just iterators, right, or cursors looping through and getting all the tuples one by one. So after we finish on the left side, now we fall down to the operator on the right side. Same thing, we call next on its child. It goes down here. And then we just emit tuples up one by one. And then now we do the probe. And then for any tuple that matches in our, in our hash table when we're doing the join, we emit that up to the parent. So is this clear? So 
The reason why, again, why it's called a pipeline model sometimes is that, say on the right side of the tree, we're back here, we call next on this guy, he calls next on this guy, now we're going to emit a tuple up to here. So we want to have, since we brought this tuple in memory, we, don't, we want to do as much work as we can to process the query while that tuple is in memory. So rather than calling next and getting the, the next one, we then pass it up here and let us do, do the, the join after we do the filter. And then if it matches, we can then pass it up even farther up the pipeline and send it up to our, our parent, which then can then produce it as, as, as an output tuple. And then, only, and then we call next all the way back down and we just do this all the way over again. So this sort of series of, of operators we can operate, we can process for a single tuple is called a pipeline. And it's just like we talked about before with uh, when doing joins, when we bring something in memory, we, we want to do as much work as possible while it's in memory before we go off to the next thing. Because the disk IOs are so expensive for us. So again, the iterator model is the most common one. It's used in pretty much every single database system you can think of. They're using the, the, the iterator model. Um, and the reason why you do this is because it's sort of a, a, from a human standpoint, it's, it's, it's easy to reason about the, 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 the program flow. It's easy to reason about what's going to be in memory versus not in memory. All right, so again, this is what pretty much every, everyone implements. So now, some, to, some operators cannot, are, are not going to be able to allow us to do pipelining all the way up. So these would be called pipeline breakers. So these are the operators that require us to get more data from our children before we can go on to do the next thing. So my join example here was a perfect choice, right? So if I'm on the, if I'm on the left side, right, I go get a tuple from this guy, I have to build a hash table. I can't process it up further in the tree because I don't know whether it's going to match with anything on the left side. So this, this would be called a pipeline breaker within this pipeline here. So I, I do the, the, the scan, I build my hash table, and now i got to go back and get the next thing because I can't continue up the tree with it. So you see the same thing for order bytes or subqueries. Anything that requires you to have more, more tuples before moving up is, is a pipeline breaker. And they're unavoidable. Right? You can't not, there's no way to get around that. The other, other nice thing about the iterator model is that output control, like limit clauses, are super easy to do because now you can then say in the parent, well, I only want 10 tuples, so if I call next 10 times and I get back 10 tuples, I'm done. Right? I don't need to go keep calling it again. So output control is, is, works, works great with this as well. Parall parallel queries also works really well, uh, and we'll cover that next class, or how to run you know, these operators on, on different threads at the same time, or different machines at the same time. OK. The, the next approach is the materialization model. And the idea here is that instead of having a next function that spits out a single tuple, each operator dumps out all the tuples anytime it's invoked. Like all the tuples it's ever going to actually uh, to, to, to emit, it comes out all at once. Right? You don't keep going back and calling next, 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 next. Right? So, of course, now the issue is going to be that if we only maybe want 10 tuples at the root, because we have a limit clause, unless we propagate down into the query plan information about the number of tuples we're actually going to need at the top, we'll end up passing along way more data than we actually needed. Right? So there's some extra stuff you have to do that you don't have to do in the iterator model to make sure you don't pass along more data that, that, than you need. And then the output could be either a materialized row or a single column. Typically in the iterator model, it's usually uh, the entire tuple, like the entire record. But in the materialization model, some systems can actually pass along a single column. But it's all the tuples. It's all the values for that, for that single column for all tuples. Right? All right, so go back to our example here. Right? Now we no longer have a next function. Right? Now we have instead a, 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 we have this, the return value is an output buffer, which is like a, just like a list of all the tuples. So we start at the begin very beginning. We call uh, child output in our root. Then this invokes the operator below us. Same thing as before. We go down and get all the tuples on the left side to build our hash table. And the result is, again, all the tuples. We take, then in our for loop, process everything, build our hash table, then go down the right side and percolate forward uh, the, the data that, that we need going up, right? And, and it's all the tuples. Yes? What's that? What is child? Yeah, there is a child there, 
So like, like it's a tree, right? This is the parent, this is this child. Okay. And you can either have one on the left side or the right side, or just one. In the what one? Sorry, the, the middle one? In the middle one. Oh, this? Yeah, yeah. So here we said there is a child. So, middle, like in this graph. Yes. In the graph on the right, which part is this? The join. Yeah. Right? It's a tree. Okay. So, I mean, the, the child means this join or. Uh, so, in this, in, in this example, uh, yeah. right, this is the projection operator. Okay. It has one child. It's the join operator. But again, because everybody's implementing the standard, uh, the same API, there's nothing in this code that knows I'm dealing with the join operator. Everyone always you know, gives you back all the tuples you need, right? Either one tuple or all the tuples are a vector in the vectorized model. So like, I, the main takeaway is that I, if I implement this standard API where they either have an output function or a next function, I can compose these operators in any different way that I want. And it's not like a major rewrite every single time. So I can now I can say, well, I first put out my system. I don't have a join operator. If I had the standard API, at some later point, I could add a join operator, and it can just fit in and work with all the other tuples. Or sorry, all the, all the other operators. It's just a standardized API that allows me to compose query plans by plopping in operators uh, based on what the query actually wants to do. OK. So again, the main difference between the iterator model and the materialization model, it's, it's, it's either one or everything. The iterator model is one tuple, materialization model is everything. Right? So once I call output and get back on, for this operator, and it spits back its buffer of all the tuples, I never go back and ask for more. I have everything I need. Yes? Would it be like one atomized tuple or like one block of tuples? What you, uh, what, his question is, is it one atomized tuple or one block of tuples? What do you mean? Like, it's everything. Uh, in, in, in our iterator model. Uh, in the iterator model, sorry. Yeah. Would it not be more efficient to like, uh, push up and then like one block at a time instead of just one? So he says, wouldn't it be more efficient to implement it where you, pay, you pass up a block of tuples instead of one tuple? Yes, that's the vectorized model. That's the next one. Yes. OK. So the materialization model is fantastic for OHP workloads because in OHP workloads, what are you doing? You're going, getting one record at a time, or one small number of records at a time. So the overhead of calling next, 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 and percolating that down, right? those function calls actually start to matter if everything's in memory. right? Because that's, a, that's a, a branch on the CPU, and those are expensive. That, and that's a jump in, you know, in, in the address space. So with the materialization model, if we're only shoving up one tuple at a time, who cares? That's awesome. That's super fast. Um, so this is actually how we implement it in VoltDB. VoltDB is based on a system I helped build in grad school called HDOR. HDOR uses the, the material, to materialization model. And VoltDB, as far as I know, still uses the same thing. Because it's an in-memory database designed for really fast transactions. It doesn't do analytics well. Right? So this is, this is fantastic for this. MonadDB is an in-memory column store system uh, out, of, uh, out of the Netherlands. It is an awesome system, too. It's not for sorry, it's not for transactions, it's for analytics. I don't know why they did this approach, but they do. Uh, and I, it has a bunch of other problems uh, that we, we, we don't want to get into, but I think this is a bad idea for this. I think this is the right choice for, for VoltDB, right? Because again, if I'm scanning a billion tuples and unless my filter is super selective, I could be shoving up a billion tuples from one operator to the next, only to find up above my query plan that I didn't need a billion tuples. I only needed like you know, maybe ten percent of that. So you end up moving a lot more data than you actually need with this with this approach. All right. So now the his suggestion, which is is what we're talking about here, is that instead of having for every single next invocation, I pass along a, a batch of tuples or a vector of tuples instead of a single tuple. Wouldn't that be more efficient? Yes. So this is what the vectorization model does. So again, for every invocation of next, we get back a batch of tuples instead of a single tuple. And then now we're going to design our system such that the inner loops, the sort of kernels of these operator implementations, they are going to be rewritten or designed to operate on a vector of tuples rather than a, uh, rather than a single tuple. And so the size of the batch that you're going to spit out for every single invocation of next can depend on what the hardware looks like. 
So that can be based also like on what the what the, the the actual storage devices are, how fast they are versus sequential versus I/O. But it also can vary on what your CPUs look like. So we're not going to get into this here because we didn't. We said in this class we weren't going to worry about CPU registers and cache lines. But if everything fits in memory uh, on modern CPUs, there's instructions that allow you to do vectorized execution or vectorized operators on a chunk of data at a time. Like this is called SIMD. If you're taking 418 or what are the parallel class, 618, 418. Um, so if you now have a batch of data that can now fit in a, in a wide CPU register, with a single instruction, you could apply a predicate or evaluate you know, some, some operator on that, on that data very, very efficiently. So this is why this vectorized approach actually is, is a good idea. So again, it, it, this now looks basically like the iterator model, but now it's inside of our, our, our um, inside of our, our, our kernel functions for operators, we have this output buffer, and then we just check to see whether the output buffer as we go down is larger than the, than the size we want to emit, and if so, then we shove back a tuple batch. But it's still the same sort of model where we're just, you know, each invocation of next goes down to our, our child, our child does some kind of processing, maybe go to, to its child to get some data, and once we have everything we need in our batch, then we shove it up and let it process. So is this clear? Okay, so the, the vectorization model is ideal for analytical queries. Because what are they doing? Analytical queries are doing long scans over large portions of the tables, and therefore, rather than for every single vacation at next getting a tuple, now I'm getting a batch of tuples. And the size of the batch can vary depending on where the data is coming from and how you're going to process it, right? This is the SIMD stuff that I talked about before. So every major data warehouse built in the last... Uh, I mean, the last 10 years or so is using the vector, vectorized model, right? The, because the performance impact is quite significant. And this is actually what we use in our system that we're building here. So is this clear? So in general, we're going to focus on the iterator model, but there's other ways to do this. So the the, the vectorized, vectorized model is sort of easy to see how you can extend the iterator model. The materialization model really only comes up in specialized systems. Uh, yes. Yes. Can't we say that since you are sending the whole data at once batch, like it will lead to lesser amount of function calls, so that can also be better for OLAP? Your your statement is with with the, with the materialization model, you're saying that the um. Since you are sending the whole data back at once. Yes. And that will lead to lesser function calls. Yes. And lesser CPU like stack. Yes. Event. Getting more so yes. that be in that way for right, so uh, statement is, um, if everything's in memory, then in the materialization model, even for OLAP, wouldn't this still be a benefit of not having to call next, next, and next over and over again if you just get back everything? Yes, but if you're reading large amounts of data and you're not able to push down the, the predicates, uh, if your predicates aren't selective <coughs> enough, meaning... The, the, the amount of data you're outputting this is large. Like, my, my table is, is like 100 gigabytes, and I'm, now I'm shoving up, you know, 90 gigabytes of data. You can be smart about it if you're doing the late materialization stuff we'll talk about in a second, but like, if you're copying a lot of data, then it sucks. But in the vectorization model, like, if you are doing next, next again, and it is going to different sections of the disk every time. All right, so we're, we're mixing terms, all right, so, or mi mixing environments. I'm saying that this works for in-memory systems. I think it, this is not good for disk-based systems, right? And I don't, I don't know of any disk-based system that actually does this. For in-memory, so, so for disk-based systems, the vectorized model uh, would be better still because, you know, the amount of, memory, amount of memory I have to keep intermediate results is smaller. I, can't, I, I don't want to have to spill a disk as I'm going up my pipeline. So the vectorized model is prefer preferable for OLAP systems. You're shaking your head as if, if, as if you are confused. No, like, I understand there are various parameters that are here and the one that went to okay. sending less data back. All right, you good? Yeah. Okay. All right, the, the last thing we want to talk about, and I just want, just, we're not going to focus too much on this, I, I just want you to be aware of it, mm -hmm. is that in all the processing model examples that I showed, iterator, materialization, and vectorize, I showed a top-down approach. 
meaning we start with the root, we call next or output on that, and then it percolates that calls down into the tree and we start pulling data up to the, to the root. That's the most common way people implement query execution, or qu these query processing models. But you can go in the other direction. You can start at the bottom and actually push data up. This is a bit rare. We did this again in, in, in VoltDB. Uh, we're doing this in our, in our new system today. Uh, Hyper out of Germany does this as well. And the reason why you want to do this is that now we can be more crafty and more careful about as we move data up to make sure that the, the tuple or that it's information that we're processing can sit around in our CPU caches and registers. So if you're very careful about your memory placement and, and your memory allocation, this way is, is preferable. But this assumes that everything fits in memory. For, so for this reason, for the disk-based systems, this approach is, is better. This is also a bit harder to, to reason about as humans because we have to write programs in a way that may not be natural for us as we normally think about how, how we write, write code. Right? Where this one, again, it, from a human standpoint, this is easy to understand. I call next on my, my child, it gives me some data. This one is actually like carefully crafting the program in such a way that is better for the CPU, but is more difficult for humans to reason about. Again, I don't want to go too much details in this. This is something, if you take the advanced class in the spring, we'll cover this. Uh, the main takeaway for you guys is everyone implements the top one for the most part. Okay? All right, so now let's talk about what's going on in those leaf nodes or in our query plan. So again, these are the access methods. These are how we're actually, actually retrieving data from the database system, from our tables, and then be able to, to pass them along to our next operators. So we've covered basically these already. Uh, I just want to spend a little more time and, and just go over them again. And then we'll talk about how to do this in, with multiple indexes. So in general, there's two approaches. You're either reading the data from an index or eating, reading it from a table with a sequential scan. And the index, not always, but could be preferable based on what query you're doing. And then the fallback solution is always sequential scan. If I don't have an index that can do what I want to do or it has like the right attributes for my query, I just fall back to a sequential scan, right? And the multi-index is sort of an extension of this. It allows us, it's, you know, instead of accessing one index, we can access multiple indexes and we combine their, their results together. Okay. So the sequential scan, again, we've covered this many, many times. It really is just a bunch of for loops inside of our operators. So the scan operator will then iterate over a single page in our table. And then for every single page, we, we iterate the tuples instead of those pages. And then we can do whatever work we want to do on them. And then we can emit them up to the, the next operator as needed. So again, the way this is implemented is like a cursor. If you're familiar with Python, they have a yield function for iterator. I, it's basically, I call this my for loop, and I call next on my iterator, and then when I get the next page, I can then iterate every single tuple, and then I can call some other function or pass this control back to another piece of the part of the system, and then if someone comes back and says, oh, give me the next tuple, I know how to pick up where I, where I left off. So operators have to maintain the state of where the iterator left off every single time it goes off and, and returns a tuple, so that when we come back, we can pick up where we left off. All right? And the typical way this is this is referred to often in systems as, as cursors. So there's a bunch of optimizations we can do to make our sequential scans go faster. And we've covered a couple of these already, right? Sequential scan, again, it's, it's, it's the fallback option if we don't have an index, if we don't have a better way to process the query. But it's slow, especially in a disk-based system where, I, where every single page could be out on disk. So with, there's a bunch of these we've covered already, right? We've talked about prefetching. This is the double buffer optimization for doing joins. We talked about doing buffer pool bypass, where instead of polluting our, our buffer pool cache, we have a little side buffer just for our, our thread or our query. We'll talk about how to run sequential scans in parallel next class. Um, so I want to focus on these three down here. Again, some of these we've already covered, uh, but again, these are just ways to make sequential scans go faster. And the idea is that, again, there's nothing we can do to magically make a sequential scan go faster. Like, the, it, we're limited by the speed of reading data from disk and bringing it to memory. But if there's ways for us to figure out how to do less work, then that's golden. That's what we want to do. And so that's what these optimizations are, are, are trying to allow us to do. So zone maps are actually what he brought up a few lectures before about pre-computing some information about pages to allow us to figure out whether we actually need to access them or not. And so the, the basic idea of a zone map is that for every single page in our database, in our, in our table, we'll have some additional metadata we've 
we've computed or derived from that page that gives us information on what's what 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 are the, what are the values inside of the page for the, for the given attribute. So let's say that we have a really simple table that has one column, right? And then within a single page, we only have uh, five tuples. So a zone map for this could have the pre-computer aggregate information about the values within this page for this column. So the min, max, average, sum, and count. So now, if I, my query comes along, that looks something like this, select star from table where value is greater than 600. So without the zone map, what do I have to do? It's a sequential scan, I go grab this page, and now I start iterate through every single tuple, and I evaluate my predicate to see whether I find a match. But instead, if I have a zone map, I can, I can say, well, I know, I think I need to access this page. Let me go look at the zone map. I'm looking for values greater than 600. Well, I go check and say, well, the max value for this, for, for this column and this page is 400. So I know there's not going to be any value, any tuple with a value greater than 400. So therefore, nothing in my page will ever match my predicate. And so I just skip looking at the entire page entirely. Right? So now you say, all right, where is this zone map actually stored? Well, some systems could pack it inside the page itself, so you still have to bring the page in, but at least now you're not iterating over every single tuple. Other systems could actually store these zone maps as separate pages. So I'll have like a zone map block or zone map page that has a bunch of zone maps for different pages. So maybe that sticks around in memory more, more, more often, and then that I just jump to that page, check the zone map, and then decide whether I want to go to the next page or go, go actually access the, the underlying page. So I use the term zone maps because that's what uh, that's sort of the common term. Uh, I forget whether it was Natiza or Oracle that invented this term, but Oracle, if you go Google Oracle zone maps, there'll be a bunch of documentation for this. I don't know whether that's a trademark term because other systems don't use that term. Uh, but it's found, again, pretty much every single major data warehouse today because the performance benefit is, is quite significant because disk is so, so slow. So you can imagine a bunch of different types of queries you could do just based on these kind of these kind of statistics. What's one issue we have with zone maps, though? The maintain that exactly right. So anytime I update something in here, then I got to make sure that this is actually in sync because I don't want to have a false false negative. I don't want to look at look at my zone map and say I don't have a match when actually I do. So these are typically all these systems I'm showing up here. These are running for the, for the analytical stuff. But you would not want to use a zone map for OLTP because, again, you have to maintain them all the time. That's going to be super expensive. But for analytics, where it's usually like write once, read a lot, then zone maps are a big win. And this is why all the major systems actually support this. All right, so the next optimization is something we talked about before. Uh, I'll make sure everyone understands it in, in further detail. Uh, this was late materialization. So for our column store system, we actually can, can delay or not or, or avoid having to propagate data from one opera to the next, and instead we just pass along offsets or column IDs to allow us to go get the actual data we need later on. Right? In a row store system, typically the operator, the output will be the actual entire tuple because I've already went to the page to, to disk to get the page that has that tuple. I might as well just pass along that entire tuple up the query plan tree and not have to ever go back and get, get more data. But in a column store, to go get all the, the data for a single tuple, that's a bunch of different reads because the, the data is broken up across different columns. And therefore, I want to avoid that as, as I want to delay that for as long as possible. So let's say we're doing a, a join of two tables, foo and bar, and say the foo table has three columns, A, B, and C. So my query plan. In my pipeline over here, as I'm processing on the, the left side of my join, well, the first thing I need for this first, uh, the filter operator, I only need the A column. So I'll just pass along, this, this iterator here will just pass along blocks or pages from, from the A column. Then I do my processing, but then I know that in my query plan, I don't need the A column ever again. Because I'm doing the join on B, I'm doing my aggregation on C, so I don't need to pass along A. So instead, I'll just pass along offsets of the, the, the tuples that passed or passed the predicate. So now inside of the join operator, I can go get the B column to complete the join. And then same thing, I don't know, I know I don't need B up above, so I just pass along the offsets. And then now when I compute the average, 
Then I go off to disk and get C, and then now I pass along the, the final result. Right? The idea here is that we can be smart about identifying what data we need at different parts of the query plan and only pass along offsets that allow us to go back and get the, the rest of the data we need at a later point. All right, the last thing to talk about is heap clustering or, or clustered indexes. Again, we've already talked about this before. This is just allowing us to uh, scan along the leaf nodes of an index and go fetch the data in, in just sequential order uh, because we know the tuples are going to be ordered in our, in our pages in the same way that they're ordered in our, in our index, right? So th th there's not much else to say about this. This one we, we've covered already. So let's talk about now how we're going to do an index scan. So the, for the basic idea of an index scan is that we want to be able to identify what index we have on our table that is going to allow us to quickly find the data that we need and, and limit the amount of useless work we have to do or wasted work we have to do. So again, it's all about reducing the, the selectivity of the data that we're processing so that we're passing along less data from one operator to the next. So how to pick one index is super hard because it depends on a bunch of different things. It depends on what attributes we have in our index, what attributes we're referencing in our query, depends on what the values of those attributes actually look like, whether they're super selective for our query or not selective, depends on what our predicates look like, <coughs> are they less than, greater than, equals to, not equals to, that determines what, whether we can use the index. And then of course it then depends on whether it's a unique index or a non-unique index. So I'm going to go through a really high level example of how we pick an index, but we'll go into this way more detail next week because this is what the query optimizer does for us. Right? I have a select statement. I don't specify what index I want to use. I want the optimizer inside the database system to say, oh, these are my choices for my indexes. Here's the best one based on what, what your query is trying to do. So again, we'll cover this in more detail uh, in next week. But let's just look through a really simple example. So say we have this simple query like this, where we want to get the, all the students from, from the students table that are under the age of 30, that are in the CS department and from come from the US. And say for this particular database, we only have two indexes. We have an index on age and we have an index on, on department. So for this particular query, what index we want to use, again, depends on what the values of the data actually look like in our table. So in the first case, say that we have, uh, we have 100 tuples and 99 of the students are under the age of 30, which is probably true for this university. Uh, but then there's only two people in the CS department, which is not true for us, but assume that's the case. So what's the best, best index to use for this? Age or index? I'm sorry, age or, 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 or department? department? Department, right? Because I'm only going to get two tuples to match for us. If I go with this, if I go for the, the, the age one, then my index scan is essentially useless because I'm just, I'm just going to find all the, the records I would have found anyway through a sequential scan. And now I, I paid the penalty of traversing the index when I didn't need to. Again, if we just reverse this and say, well, there's 99 people in the CS department and only two people on the age of 30, well, again, now the, 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 the age index is better for us because that's more selective. So, so at a high level, this is what we're trying to do in our index scan. We're trying to avoid having to go read data we don't, we don't necessarily need. And that includes also you know, the cost of going actually probing the index. So if the data system can recognize that, well, I'm not going to be very selective for this index, and I'm going to pay the penalty of, of traversing that index or doing a lookup in the hash table for that index, then it's just better to do a sequential scan. Again, we'll, we'll reason about how to actually make this decision more next week. But the, what I do want to focus on, though, is what happens if both indexes are a good idea? Right? We could be stupid and just flip a coin and say, all right, I'll just roll the dice and see that, you know, I'll pick the age one, that, that'll be good enough. But the database system can recognize that both of them are actually going to help me a lot and be very selective. Then I want to do probes on both of them, get back the results, and then combine them away in a certain way based on what the query is actually trying to do, and then use that combined result to then figure out what data actually matches or find the data that I'm looking for. Yes? But then we'll have to find both the values? His, his question is we'll have to find both the values? What do you mean? Uh, that, that 30 and 2. Like how will you decide? How will you decide what? Uh, which, which index to choose. In this example, both. No, uh, the previous one. Previous one? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so 
for each of these scenarios, which one had we decided to pick? No, picking is okay, but but then you came to the conclusion based on the numbers, right? So you have to compute both the numbers, thirty and two. Won't that be an issue? You have to com convert. You have to compute both the numbers thirty and two. Uh, like how? Yeah, like yeah. We will cover this next week. Okay. We have these. Okay. Yeah, like well, we have an approximation of this. It's not always accurate. That can lead to problems. But assume we have we know something. This is like in this extreme example, it's super obvious. We would know that like there's two people you know in the CS department. We would know that this is like this is an outlier, and that this is this would be, it's the other way. It's usually have a hitter. We would know this one's super common, so we we would choose that or not choose that. Yes. This question is: Is an index scan always better than, than a uh, uh, is an index scan always better than a sequential scan? No. Yeah, but we'll cover that in a few more slides. Yes. His question is, if it's not a clustered index, we could have random I/O. How do we solve that? Give me like two slides, three slides. Oh, yeah. Yes. So in this case, two people out of a hundred are in the CS department. Yes. Then we still have to use the CS. I, I mean, the department index a hundred times. Right? Like we still have to. Oh, all, right, so, all right. So his question is, in this case here, uh, would I have to probe the index a hundred times? Yeah, for each. No, because it's like I do. I like. I don't have the query plan here. Yeah. So, in think think of my 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 leaf nodes of my query plan for the, for this query. I called next, right at the leaf node to access the actual table. Well, I'm accessing it through an index, and the index is going to do a probe now to find all the the students in the CS department, and it's going to find it's if it's a B plus tree, it would find the. The, the left side in the leaf node where, where all the students in the CS department begin, I emit the first tuple I find, that goes up to my, to my parent, the parent comes back and calls next again, now my iterator jumps to the next one in the leaf node, that's another student in the CS department, I emit that up, come back again, now I, I iterate to the next one, oh, now it's in you know, the biology department, that doesn't match my predicate, I return null. So I probe the index once and I scan along the leaf nodes till I find everything I'm looking for. Right? Now his question is: His question is, is a index scan always preferable to this, the a sequential scan? No, because like if I'm matching everyone, like in the case of 99 people in the CS department, now I'm paying the penalty to traverse down the index. That's just wasted I/O or wa wasted lookups. It would have been better just to jump to the beginning of the table and scan it down sequentially. So where that cutoff point? Like this in this case is obvious. 99% of the tuples match. Sequential scan is the right way to go. Where that threshold is. It depends on the cost model inside the query optimizer inside the database system, and that's going to vary between different systems. And so Monday next week, I always feel, I always feel like I'm always saying like, all right, next class or this two more classes we'll discuss this, and uh, and it, I'm trying to focus on just one idea. But next week we will show how do we derive this information and then use it to make it to make an approximation about which one is better. So not only whether which index is the best one to use, but whether a sequential scan will still be better. We'll cover that next week. For now, we're focusing on how do we, what, you know, what does this execution actually look like? All right. So again, the multi multi index scan is doing multiple lookups on different different indexes, and then we'll combine the results based on what the predicate is. So if it's a we, if we have a conjunction, an and clause, then we use an intersection. If it's an or clause, a disjunction, we use a union. We're just combining these sets together. So and then for any tuples that that that, that records that match. After our, our combination, we then can though again do a lookup to find them and, and do additional processing. So all the major database systems support this. Uh, they call it different things. If you use Postgres, sometimes you'll see in the explain output, they'll call this a bitmap scan. This is essentially what they're doing. They're building some kind of they're building a bitmap where every bit corresponds to a record at some location. And then now they can combine them together using you know bit manipulation operators. But different systems do different things. Yes. On the leaf nodes, yes. Yeah, but it's not. It, it it depends on the predicate, right? If it's an in clause, you could that would be multiple probes. If it's some kind of like range clause, you can do a sequential scan along the leaf nodes. So it, I, would, I shouldn't use the term sequential scan. A range scan is what it's called on the index leaf nodes. Like if, if you're a hash table, then all your index values are not 
Yes. Then, then again, you, you, you do multiple probes. Yeah, so again, when you write your SQL query, you don't write it like, oh, I know I have a hash table index. I should do, you know, I should write this kind of query. You don't know, you don't care. I mean, you, at a high level, you don't know, you don't care. The data system can figure out, oh, I have a hash index on, on this attribute and a B plus tree index on the same attribute. Depending on what my predicate is, I, it knows how to pick which one and does that all for you. That's the beauty of SQL, right? The beauty of a declarative language, that you don't have to worry about how things are actually being physically stored. So I could drop the index and the query still works. It, it falls back to a sequential scan, but it still works. Okay, so again, here's that same query we had before. And so this time we have an index on both age and department. And so what we'll do is we'll first retrieve all the record IDs that match age less than 330 in our index. Then we'll do the same thing. It could be in a different thread at the same time. It could be the same thread. It doesn't matter. They do a lookup on the department. Then you take the intersection of these two, uh, the outputs of these two indexes, because it's an and clause, so a conjunction. And then any additional uh, records that match after the intersection, we then do a lookup uh, to actually get the tuple and apply the final predicate on the country equals US. So again, visually, it looks like this. Probe, uh, do a lookup on age equals less than 30 on this one. Department equals CS on this one. And then whatever ones are in the middle are then the ones we know that match both of these indexes. And therefore, that, those are the ones we actually want to look because that would match our, our conjunction. And then we go retrieve them and check whether country equals US. So what we're actually generating here could be, uh, again, a bitmap. Like if it's in Postgres, it could be another a hash table that we could pot potentially combine with another hash table or do a join. Could be a, that bloom filter we talked about before. Right? It doesn't matter. Different systems do different things. Ideally, you want this to be as succinct as possible because you don't want to have a really large hash table for every single tuple that matches both of them and try to combine them. So you just have an efficient way to do an intersection, and then you go back and get the rest of the data that you need. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about for access methods is what he was asking about before, and I think this has come up uh, a couple of times in the, in the semester, is if I have an unclustered index, and I'm scanning along the leaf nodes, I'm jumping around potentially at random to different record IDs uh, at different pages because the, the tuples are not sorted the same way that leaf nodes are sorted in the, in the index. So in worst case scenario, say I only have one, you know, one buffer page where I can store something in you know, a single page in my buffer pool, then every single time as I'm scanning along the, the leaf nodes, I'm, I'm reading a page, if the page I'm looking at is not the same as the last one I just retrieved, then that's another disk I.O. to go fetch this. But depending on what my query is, if the output does not need to be sorted on the ID that the, the, the index is based on, then before I actually do any lookups on the data, I scan along, get all the record IDs, then I sort them based on their page IDs. And so now for every single page, they're grouped together and it's one I.O. to get the one page. I process all the tuples that are inside that page before I move on to the next one. All right, this is the beauty of the relational model. The relational model is unordered. So we're allowed to do this any way we want. It doesn't matter that the, you know, that the output could be different from one day to the next. Because you can't, you're not in your application, if you cared about things being ordered a certain way, you would have to write a specific order by clause. So one day our tuples, you know, two tuples that maybe uh, close together in, in, the, in the sort order might exist on the same page. And the next day, after some compaction or some garbage collection process, they're now on different pages. So I could end up getting a different result for the same query, and that's OK. We're allowed to do that. So there's a bunch of stuff we can do as we're processing data that could change the result, change the, doesn't change the high level correctness, but could change the, the exact output ordering. All right, so any questions about this? Yes. Your question is, for, like, after you do the sorting, do you have to walk through? So it's like you sort based on page. So say I, I, there's two tuples I need in page 101. I, I know what page they're in. They're in page 101. I know the slot number. So then as, as, I, as I bring the page in, I jump to slot one, I jump to slot five, and I go find the tuples that I want. 
you're not iterating, you're not scanning through because you're not looking at every single tuple. You're only looking for the tuples that this thing matched up here. Yeah. Yes. Um, we mentioned about how to maintain the cluster index because, like, if we have a cluster index and we insert some data, then we have to review. Correct. So his question, I, I, and I should have covered this last week. How do you actually maintain a clustered index? Because if, say, this this page is full, and then I insert something and the sort order fits in here. Do I, did that mean I have to like then reshuffle everything? Yes. Unless you store everything in, like in MySQL or in a, in a DB, the, the, the pages, or the leaf nodes themselves are the, where the tuples are actually being stored. So as you do splits and merges and you're moving key values you know, from one page to the next, that's, that's the same thing. If there's a disconnect, if it's an index organized, if it's, sorry, if it's a clustered index that's not connected exactly to the underlying data pages, yes, there's a bunch, you have to do a bunch of extra work. This is why most systems that's index organized or cluster indexes are not the default. Yes. So his question is, if it's like sort limit ten, like if there's an order by with a limit clause, you can't do this. Correct. Yes. But again, the data system knows this. We have rules in our query optimizer to recognize that you know, like oh, so that would be that, that's an example of a pipeline breaker to do an order by. I have, to have, I have to see all the tuples to know what the, the global sort order is. I, and I can't go now to the limit clause up above me in my query plan until I finish that sorting. Yes? Can you explain that again? Why you can't do that? Okay, yeah, so let's... I should have an example. Let's, let's just use this, the... Go back to the iterator model. Okay, so pretend that this, instead of this being a... Uh, a, a projection, it's an order by. And then there's, there's a, actually, make this to be the order by, make this one above it be the limit. So the order by is a pipeline breaker. I don't know the complete sort order of all the, the records until I see all the records. Because if I try to start sorting them just by seeing partial, you know, you know, I see, you know, I see 9, 10, 11, I sort them, but then I don't see, you know, value 1 because I haven't called next yet, now my sort ordering is incorrect. So a pipeline breaker says you cannot proceed up in the query plan until you get all the tuples you need. So the order by here would be a pipeline breaker, and then if I have an order by with a limit clause, and I want to pick the, the top 10 tuples after they're being sorted, I can't do that top 10 until I have everything ordered. Make sense? So order by, subqueries, joins, uh, limit clauses with order bys would be a pipeline breaker. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Mins, maxes, things like that. So how does it relate to an index scan? So the index scans are down here, right? It's just you know for this for T and R. I'm not saying what R is, or how we're, what this for loop actually is. It could be a sequential scan, it could be an index scan. So if it's a if it's a sequential scan, it's unordered. So I'd have to have my order by calls do up above do a bunch of extra stuff. But if I am Doing an index scan, and my my pro my range scan and my index, and it's and the sort order of the index is the same as my order by clause up above. Then I know these two boys are going to come out in sorted order, so I don't need to do my order by up above. So again, but we, we know all this ahead of time as we're generating this query plan because we know exactly what the query plan is because it's declarative. There's no like. There's no magic function that we don't know what it's going to be until we actually run it. It's not entirely true, but for now, that's the case. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is how do we actually evaluate these predicates? We have these where clauses, we have these join clauses. How do we actually, you know, how do we actually make sense of this? So the way we're going to do this is that we're going to represent the where clauses as, as an expression tree. And all the nodes in our expression tree are going to represent the different types of expressions that, that we can have in our predicates. So all the comparisons, conjunctions, disjunctions, ar arithmetic operators, function calls, uh, lookups for actual tuples, constant values, all these things can now be represented in, in a tree. So for this particular example here, I have my own clause where RID equals SID, 
and then a where clause with s dot value greater than 100. So I could represent this entire predicate, the combination of the join clause and the where clause, as, as a tree. In my root, I have, an, uh, I have the conjunction, the in operator. On one side, I have the quality predicate. It matches RID and SID. The other side, I have the, the, the greater than uh, operator for the attribute value, uh, sorry, the value of the, the value of the value attribute uh, for the tuple, and then the, the constant 100. So just like before, as in a query plan, we can go from top to bottom. We'll do the same thing here to determine whether the, the tuple matches. So let's, let's look at a more simple example. So here we have a query where select start from S, and then our where clause is where B dot value equals question mark plus one. So we haven't talked about, I don't think we talked about prepared statements yet, but prepared statements are like a way to, to, to declare a, like a query template. Like you, you tell the data system ahead of time, hey, I'm gonna execute this query over and over again, and here's a placeholder where you can fill in a value at runtime. So you'll, you then, you'll invoke this query almost like a function, and you'll pass in a value that gets substituted at runtime. We'll cover that, I think, uh, maybe next week or after the midterm. But is, is this clear what's going on here? It's just a placeholder, yes? Yeah, but why can I use plus one? Why can you do that? Yeah, no, like, what's the point of it? So, like, I'll replace the question mark, right? Yes. And then I say, okay, add plus one. Yes, so why not just have plus one be done on the client side? Exactly. Sure, so that is a, uh, that's a philosophical <laughs> question. No, so, like, Think about this. So I always have to add plus one, right? So let's say that I have my, I have a big application. I have my, I have the desktop version. I have a, a web-based version and I have a phone application. And they're all gonna use this query. That means I, if I always make sure I have to call plus one, I gotta make sure that on all three different programs, they call plus one. But if that's logic that should always be, that I wanna hide away from the application, then I can write it be in my, in my query, and then all of them get to use that. The plus one is like a trivial example, but think of other things like uh, you know, more, more, more complex operations. This is, just to play, this is just to show you what, what's gonna happen in the tree. Yes. We would, so we'll call that, we'll have a whole lecture called server-side program logic, server-side execution. We'll cover that after the midterm. But why, and it's a trade-off though, because now we have like, there's the logic for our application is now split between the database system and the application code itself. And this is why I'm saying it's philosophical. Some people say, oh, the database system should know everything and because I, I, I can reuse that logic across all different applications. Other people say that's a bad idea because now, like, as a programmer, I'm writing some, you know, crappy Python code and there's some, the database system is doing a bunch of stuff that I don't know what it's doing. So it's better for me to put everything in my application code because the pro programmer can see that. It's a long, it's a long answer for why plus one is in here, but... Uh, trust me, it, it, there's, there's, some useful, there's some usefulness to this. Okay, so the expression for this, the where clause, where b.value equals question mark plus one, would look like a tree like this. So in order to invoke and evaluate this expression, we need to have some contextual information about what's going on in our query as we invoke this expression. So we'd say, well, what's the current tuple we're processing? Again, think of this as like, we're gonna call evaluate, inside of the, the for loop, inside of our, one of our operators. So for every single tuple we're getting, we're gonna, we wanna evaluate this tree. So we need to know what's the current tuple we're looking at. We also need to know what our input parameters are for this query. Right, so this is what the client passed us when they wanna evoke this query to, to, to substitute the question mark. So in this case here, it's 999. And then we need some information about the schema of the tuple that we're processing. So we need to know like, you know, here's the, here's the record, the first attribute is called ID, and it's integer. The second one is called value, and it's also integer. Right? It's just more context about what the tuple actually looks like. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to start at the root, we call evaluate, and then we just go down in, in, in depth-first manner to each of our leaf nodes and start moving, moving values up. So we start here, go to the left side, and this is an expression that says, go retrieve the... Uh, the S value, the, the value attribute from the, the current tuple. So this would then just generate 1,000, one right? Because the current tuple we're looking at has for the value attribute 1,000. So then now I go back up here and go, again, going depth for search. Oh, shit, sorry. Um, we get on this side, and this says, oh, give me the parameter at offset zero. I look at my context at offset zero, it's 999. So this thing generates 999. I jump up here, I go down to the other side, it says, give me the constant value of one. 
that then you know produces a one. That gets shoved up to here, and now I evaluate 999 plus one. That's a thousand. Then I shove that up to here for my equality predicate, and it says, does a thousand equal a thousand? Yes, result is true. So this tuple would match this particular predicate. So is that clear? So this is just we're doing this for every single tuple we, we we're looking at inside of our inside of our for loop in one of our operators. Is this good or bad? Let me rephrase that. Is this fast or slow? He says he says we're doing the plus every single time uh, unnecessarily. Yes. So again, we'll cover this when we do query optimization. But one obvious thing that he pointed out here is this thing is this is also a constant too. Nine 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 is always going to be the same because that was passed into the query. So we could rewrite this and have it be just rewrite this thing just to be a constant value of a thousand. Yes. But you still you know you're still going down the tree. That, that actually sucks. So what I'm describing here, again, is what every single database system, the first time they're implemented, well, well, this is how they implement their, their expressions. But it's going to be slow, because now if I have a billion tuples, I'm calling that function to evaluate the expression tree and traversing the expression tree a billion times. So the high-end systems don't do this. Right? And the super-optimized systems don't do this. So instead, what they want to do is Almost the same thing as, oops, sorry, just-in-time compilation. So say I have a stupid predicate like this, where 1 equals 1. Now I realize, like, again, you, you can optimize this away, where it's just always evaluates to true. But assume, assume that you, you had a crappy system that was always going, you know, always had this tree and always had to traverse it. What you instead want to do is actually compile exactly the, uh, the, the, the predicate you want to evaluate for a given tuple. Right, so now I can write in, in one instruction constant value one equals constant value one on the CPU, and that's way faster than traversing this tree, doing lookups, you know, to see what kind of expression type I am, figuring out what kind of output I need to copy back, then having these giant switch statements to say, well, what's the operator I'm trying to evaluate? Is it an equal clause? Is it a less than clause? If I can just strip down to be exactly what the, the, the predicate wants to do, that's going to be way faster. So again, this is what the high-end systems do. Postgres 12 just added this. Uh, and, and it's quite limited at this point, but this is, you know, MySQL doesn't do this as far as I know, but like the high-end systems and the better open source systems can do this. And the spoiler again for, for the system we're building here at CMU, not only do we compile down the predicates into simple instructions, we actually compile the entire query plan to be, be, to be just a pipeline of instructions. And then now you no longer again, you don't have indirection, you don't have jump clauses. It's just sort of like one giant function that executes exactly your query plan. Sort of like it's like as almost someone wrote the code exactly to execute your query and then compiled it, we can do this on the fly. Okay. So the main takeaway from this is that the same query plan and different systems can be executed in different multiple ways. And this depends on the environment, whether it's a com store or a row store. Depends on the workload, whether it's a OLAP system or OTP system. But as I said, the iterator model, the top-down approach, is the most common one, and that's you'll see that the most in the wild. In most cases, the data center is going to always prefer to use an index scan over a sequential scan as much as possible. There'll be some in cases where this is not going to actually work out. Um, and then the expression trees are nice because, again, as humans, they're, they're easy for us to reason about and understand the correctness of the predicates we're evaluating. But in practice, they're going to be super slow, and instead, you want to compile them down. All right. Any questions about you know query execution so far? And hopefully, you've seen what we've done in the semester. Is that we've talked about again all these different parts of the system: how to do the scans, how to build the indexes, how to have a buffer pool, and now we're starting to put all these things together and actually build a full system. Okay. All right. So next class, we will continue on query execution. But we're going to focus on how to actually query, execute queries in parallel, right? And and the distinction I'll make between distributed and parallel systems is that for parallel execution, we're talking about running a single query on a single database instance, on a single box. Distributed execution will be running queries on multiple machines. But a lot of the ideas that we'll talk about in this lecture will be applicable to the distributed environment. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, enjoy the weather, and I'll see you on Wednesday. 
Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry I He's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the be champ, stressed out. Could never be son. Rick and say jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The pawns in the bushes. St. Nas still a canteen. Can. Crack the bottle of the St. Nas. Sip it through those who don't realize. The drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive. Keep my people still alive. And if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.